um, auto logged in through my my kids account through her school. Um, and I don't have a Gmail account that will allow Google Meet. So I am not Marie Therese Morosky. I am Catherine Dorr. Um, and I'm just borrowing someone's account. Um, so please, uh, I apologize for the, the confusion. And then I also wasn't able to share the PowerPoint through my login. So I emailed it to Soleil and she's going to um, drive. You're going to drive, right? Um, yeah, and click through. But uh, thank you so much for inviting me here um, to present um, a recent paper um, that I published um, and some aspects of my research um, that relate to the project that y'all are involved in. Um, the paper that uh, that I'm going to talk about is entitled "Shoots and Ladders: Gendered Systems of Occupational Inequality in University Science," um, and I nestle that in a larger um, research agenda where I look at um, the, the experiences of science faculty um, in higher education and how they um, have more or less teaching intensive roles and how that depends on gender. So if you can move forward, Soleil. Um, I, I'm hoping to spend about an hour with you today and have a really um, time for presenting some of my research and then also time to have a generative discussion that relates to your own experiences. I'd like to start with a little icebreaker just so that we can uh, have a little bit of time to talk to each other um, and that should take a couple minutes. And then I'll give you some background on the, um, the theory that I use to frame the research that I do. Um, I'll ask you to connect a little bit of the theory to your own experience so you can see how that might work um, in, in an empirical study that I'll present to you, the Shoots and Ladders study. And then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end for a wrap-up discussion. So moving on. Um, let's see, we have... Six people. Sorry, the otter otter box is not a um, is not a login, right? Uh, is not a person. So, um, can you put us into groups of two, Sole, in yeah. breakout rooms? Yeah. And then we're just going to take one minute. So each each person talk for one minute to each like take turns. Talk for one, then someone else talk, and then we're going to come back and kind of report out. Okay, we're going, I think it is now. So, hi Cindy, how are you? Oh. Hello? 
And go back to the slide, please. The slide before, please. Okay, so this is just a little activity that I like to do rather than going around and talking about ourselves because I often feel like I'm just like trying to think about what I'm gonna say and I don't listen to other people. So um, what we'll do instead is we'll talk about our partner. Um, so I will go first. I talked to Asmita and um, Asmita worked in engineering and process engineering for 17 years before moving on to something that was more societally oriented and she is currently job hunting. Um, Asmita? Yes. Actually, um, it it, sorry, it doesn't work if um if you go because then you would just call on me. So I'm just gonna call on people, okay? Um, Wolfgang. Can you can you tell us about your one thing about your partner? She was not in, sorry, she left the she left Oh she, she left. Was, she left immediately, yes. No, so I didn't know who she was. Okay, well then tell us about yourself because you didn't get to talk to anyone. Okay, One important um, thing about yourself. About myself, uh, I'm not a technician. Uh, from my background, I'm a political scientist. Uh, I worked for many years at the university, and I have a small uh, consulting company working mainly on Erasmus Plus projects. And I'm here together now with my four kids. So I hope you cannot hear them in the background. We cannot, okay. but I wouldn't mind if we did. That would be okay. All right, call it, or I'll call in someone else. Sorry, Stefania, yeah. who did you talk to? Oh, yes. Yeah, so I talked to Cindy, but in fact, I, I didn't get to hear her uh, background because um, I think we consider we have more time. So we ran out of time. Uh, and so uh, I don't know. She only got to say, I think she's an archaeologist. and. And that's it. So I I hope she can share more. She interested to, to hear about her. Okay. Um then Elsa, did you get put in a group? No, I, I joined late, so uh, yeah, I didn't uh, okay. do this. All right, so um, Elsa, why don't you just give us a little background about yourself? Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'm uh, a computer engineer um, okay. and yeah, I previously worked with uh, as an environmental consultant. So I did this as a, like a change career thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right, and then Cindy. Uh, you're our yes, last participant. Uh, I'm sorry. I um I have some technical problems here in the new place I am sitting. Uh, mm -hmm. So then we didn't have so much time with Stefania. 
uh, but uh, as to, I, I just mentioned it quickly that I'm no archaeologist. I am geologist um, okay. and has been involved in this STEAM um, project. But about Estefania, yeah, she to, uh, to told me that he has been uh, leading up the, the project. She has wrote this um, uh, proposal like how to develop the and involve more uh, young um, girls in this team. Cool. And then Asmita, I'm going to let you um, tell them what I told you or something about me. And then I want to add one thing after you talk. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Um, I forgot your name again because I kept seeing So Marie my name Grace. is Catherine, not Catherine. Marie Grace. Okay. Yeah. And also just really Catherine. sorry about that. Yeah, sorry for that. But I just kept <laughs> seeing Marie there. Yeah. So Catherine um, totally is get currently it. working in Malmo University. Previously, she was a physics and chemistry teacher in high school back in America. And here now she's with us to share this amazing webinar. I guess that's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to add on that um, the, uh, the the reason that I am going to show you the next slide is because I got into studying gender in the sciences due to my own gendered experiences. Um, like Asmita said, I was a high school teacher, but before that, I started a PhD in chemistry. And I left after two years because I didn't feel like I belonged in a lab. And it wasn't because I wasn't good at it or that I didn't like it. It was just this feeling that that wasn't a place that I could progress in a career. And I didn't really know why until I went back to get a PhD in education. And I learned that I wasn't the only one who inexplicably kind of left the sciences and went to something else. Um, so, Soleil, if you can um, move the, the slide to the next one. This theory that gender works as a social structure to reproduce inequality has been really helpful for me both to understand what my own personal experience was and then to understand the experiences of people that I um, do research with um, in terms of their gendered scientific career experiences. And so this theory that was advanced by a sociologist, Barbara Risman, and builds on other theories about how social categories produce inequality, um, thinks about social, social systems as operating on multiple levels. There's the individual level, there's the interactional level, and there's the institutional level. And in all of these places, both material and cultural factors work to produce methods that inequality can occur, can be, can be made. And so for example, um, on the individual level, the way we're socialized or the way that we, I, that we feel our identity is, is a cultural piece of gender. On the interactional or the social relational level, things like representation and what kind of social networks we can access, as well as cultural things like stereotypes, bias, expectations for what should happen to us, um, work within social relations. And then even further up at an institutional level, um, things like the way uh, resources are distribution, rules of the institutions, don't worry about it, um, Wolfgang, we're glad you're here and just um, as much as you can participate is great. Um, and then things like hegemonic beliefs are sort of built into cultures. And what that means is that gender exists at multiple levels and they interact with each other. So that's what all those arrows are showing. And what you get is gender becomes part of the social system and the way that we relate to each other. And Sociologists argue that it is the most recognizable social marker. Um, race and ethnicity is also a very recognizable social marker, but gender is so built in to the way we navigate our world that it often produces, or historically has, produced something that like is almost a feeling of vertigo when we can't recognize and categorize gender almost immediately. It's like a master category that that exists underneath all of the other ones. And it's particularly salient in settings that 
are often associated with masculinity or men, such as the STEM fields. So moving on, how does the gender, how does gender theory or gender as a social system relate to STEM? A lot of research has been done on how this works. So at the individual level, people recognize more readily that scientific authority is carried by men than women, which means that women in STEM fields have to work harder to be recognized as authorities within STEM, um, within STEM disciplines. The work climate is differently perceived and experienced by men and women. Um, and there's also research that just, um, and this is more, more specifically towards sort of getting PhDs in academic and entering academic careers in the sciences, but um, entering parenthood can be something that guides choices for women much more highly than men when they enter scientific careers and all of these inst individual experiences when they play out in social relations have effects on institutional patterns so um the ideal worker norm is is something that often matches what we expect at work to an ideal body which is most often categorized as a um able-bodied cisgendered middle class white man and everybody else's experience as at work sort of can maybe match that a little bit but never come close to the ideal worker norm and what this does is in the sciences specifically it produces and in other fields it produces vertical segregation in stem careers and what that means is often within um, a, a workplace setting women are clustered at lower levels than men. And that's something that I look specifically at in my own research. But before we move on to talking about my recent paper, I'd like you to discuss a little bit. So Soli, could you move on to the next slide? Um, um, discuss how, based on what I've told you, how you have experienced being a gendered body in STEM. And what patterns do we see across our experiences? So because we're such a, like a, a, a we're a small number of people, I'm not going to put us, I'm not going to ask Sully to put us into breakout rooms, but rather for the first bullet point, would you just take a moment and jot something down? So don't, rather than holding it in your head, write down one way that you have experienced being a gendered body in STEM. <clears throat> Should we just type our thoughts in the chat box, uh, in the message? That's a good idea. Should we do that? If, ever, if we're open to that, we can do that. Sure. Yeah, I think you could leave also. Yeah.
Did everyone get to post something who wants to? Seems so. I don't know about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, does anyone have a a thought about the patterns that we see across these experiences? I think it's really frustrating. <laughs> it's basically the thing was initially designed for for males to move around, but then they didn't have any clue how to do it for females. So there's no workaround for them to adjust everything. That's something that I find kind of really frustrating in a similar manner. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Stefania, you can talk. Uh, yeah, so um, my, my background and my interests uh, relate to recent culture. However, I always use technology and it's really funny because um, people assume that, you know, the cultural capital and the social capital um, are just equivalent uh, to the gender. And, uh, in regards to the gender representation, uh, we are seen as, um, you know, um, just a reflection of the gender that so society has let's say assign us with or that structure structurally structurally speaking we have this certain identity and, and uh it comes across as part of um uh, a human capital but also as you mentioned all the levels and the layers are interconnected and you can see a thread um and you mentioned patterns for me the pattern has to do with uh stereotyping um and uh, predominantly relates to not how we think uh, women are less competent, but how we consider, I mean, as societies, that men are more competent. So it relates to more how we uh, consider men more capable of doing certain tasks or being involved let's say, in STEM disciplines, and therefore the stereotyping is just um, reflected into saying, oh, you would do this uh, if you are male, and you will do this if you are a woman, because I consider that my the, the task will be better completed if it's done by a male figure, mm. I assume. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and what strikes me is how different people invoked different levels. So Asmita's comment is really like the institutional piece of how the institution is set up, right? And it makes it hard for women to participate. My comment is very personal, but it speaks to the additional kind of emotional or mental labor that we might need to put in to be able to participate in the man's world, the things that are set up for men to do. And that um, that like that additional that um, individual piece then can feed over into into the ways that we're related to the stereotypes that are put on us and so forth. Um, so, does anyone else have a, a comment before we move on? Um, I think I just, uh, it just, it struck me that uh, it, it, regardless of the area that we are working or we have the background with, and regardless of the culture, is there like, is the pattern is, is clearly, is the same, right? And it, it's, it's uh, it doesn't matter what we chose, even if it's not a STEM, but in a STEM it's even maybe worse, but it's regardless of what we chose to do, we and I th we include us. Uh, we 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 put the men in the in the position in which they choose uh, where to put us, even in the mm -hmm. career. So yeah, yeah. And so the, what I want to talk to you about now is um, is the research that I do um, on uh, STEM 
faculty. So people who work in higher education in science departments and the ways that this gender system works within a department. And so um, just to, I think we can move on. Um, okay, and so the paper that I published uh, pre pretty recently in June, um, Shoots and Ladders, Gendered Systems of Privilege and Mar Marginalization in University Science Teaching, looks at a particular job category that um, I was kind of drawn to exploring um, in the United States, which was called the non-tenure track faculty. And in the non-tenure track faculty um, who were working at a research intensive university in the United States, you can move on, Soleil. Um, uh, an interesting thing was happening with gender. So within this physical science department, research and teaching activities occurred. Because at this particular university, there was a lot of emphasis placed on research, the status and the authority went to people who did research and teaching was considered kind of the secondary burden that had to be done. Um, like many of the sciences, you can go on, the department itself was male dominated. Sully, can you move move on, please? Sorry, I was kind of inserted that weirdly. And and the research track, women were highly underrepresented. There were it was only about fifteen percent women out of thirty um, tenure track or research track professors. Um, it was only about fifteen percent women, which is actually four, four or five, and they were clustered at the lowest level. So there were there was only one woman who was a professor, and the rest were at the assistant professor level. But the department was not devoid of women, they were clustered in a non tenure track role. So so they move on, please. In the non tenure track, who did the majority of teaching at, in this department, they were responsible for all undergraduate classes and about 15,000 undergraduates were taking these classes in this department every year. Um, it was about 60% women. All of these um, faculty had PhDs, and they all um, had gone into this non-tenure track role because they had been given the message when they were pursuing PhDs that the research track was too harsh and competitive of a place for women to be able to form families, have satisfying work-life balance and so forth. And they were sort of directed into a place that was better for women, which would be more teaching intensive and not as stressful. And so I was interested to know, well, is this a good place for women to be? Is because women have a difference, you know, by gender, maybe this is this is this is a, a, a good place for women to work because um, science research is so cutthroat. I don't necessarily believe that, but I was wondering what was happening in the non-tenure track. And so I spent two years um, kind of embedded in the lives of the non-tenure track faculty doing work that's called um, a research method that's called ethnography. I went to their classes with them. I went to their meetings with them. I had lunch with them. Um, and I also interviewed them about what I saw and the kinds of themes that I, um, that I, the kind of patterns that I thought might be shaping their work lives. And so what I found was that even within the non tenure track, men were still privileged. So could you move on, Soleil? One of the themes that I that I um, discovered was that the men versus the women in the non tenure track put in different effort and time. So one of the um, these faculty, she was new to the job. She had completed her PhD in the department. She said that about a month or two after I began this job, so she she started as a teaching faculty. She was bored. She said, I'm so bored, I need another project. This cannot be my only job. I have all this extra time. So after working really hard to get a PhD in, in the sciences, she didn't feel like she was being worked hard enough um, with her teaching job. And so they gave her demonstrations. So she went and sought out more work when she didn't feel like she was well utilized. Contrast this to her male peer, who was about the same age and also completed his PhD in the department. You can move on to the next slide. Um, this 35 year old man um, who taught the same course as her said, mm, it's not that hard of a job. I think a lot of the teaching faculty have trouble not taking it home with them, but I'm like, whatever, I'm done. So he had a much more casual attitude towards the work and it actually showed in his teaching. 
he was not as polished of, a, of an instructor. He wasn't as innovative. He kind of did the job and went home. Um, whereas this 30-year-old woman and most of the women put in a lot of effort to their teaching and I would say were, um, were, were very uh, progressive educators. Next slide, please. And this, but even though the women were putting in more effort and time, they lacked recognition and respect. So another faculty member who had been in the same job for 20 years um, and had raised three children um, said that, and, and who, were, who were now like getting ready to leave the house or some had already left, she wanted to kind of grow in her career. She said, I'm at the point in my life where I have really good ideas and I have the skills to follow through and implement them. But I also have no authority and I get no respect from some people. It's frustrating. Contrast this to um, her office mate, who was the same age. They had worked together for years. They were good friends. Um, he said something very, very different to me in an interview. For the most part, for the most part, the right people respect me, and those are the ones in a position to keep me. Especially those who I have had to work with, at some, who who have had to work with us at some sort of level, and realize, oh, they actually know they they actually know a lot about how to teach. So. His perception is that he's well respected by the right people. His female peer who works in close contact with him says almost the opposite. Moving on, this also showed in their pay. <clears throat> the young woman who asked for more work also thought she should get better pay. But in trying to increase her pay, she said, even there, even even having only been there for two to three years, she said, you have to push really hard and it burns bridges. I tell all of them to like straight to their face. I'm going to negotiate like a man. So this is a, this kind of is, um, invokes that individual piece, right? She needs to change the way her body performs in order to have a, so, uh, a relation, an interaction that allows her to feel like she can ask for more pay with that. That's like totally within her rights to request. On the other hand, her um, uh, an older man sees it completely differently. He said, I see how dependent they are on teaching faculty because they need the manpower and we're too cheap to fire. It costs them a lot of money to have a professor teaching and it costs them le way less, three times less to have me teach it. Now he got paid a, like a third more than she did. So he was making more and he describes the work that they do as manpower, which is sort of ironic given that it's ma mainly women who do the work and then says, oh, we're too cheap to fire. Whereas she has to burn bridges to try to get a raise. Um, next slide, please. And finally, um, advancement was viewed very, very differently by the men and the women on the teaching faculty. So a 40 year old woman who had been there for about 10 years, she also did her PhD in the department said, I would like to do more, but I don't think I have a track record that shows my skill set because they didn't they don't have a way to document um, their work for an advancement path. It's so unconventional, which means there are not a lot of people who can vouch for what I'm doing. She had done a lot of curriculum redesign. She had advanced the, the teaching in the department, yet she didn't have a way to document it. And so she was kind of stuck or she felt like she was stuck. Contrast this to her male peer who said, when I meet with my colleagues, who's a little bit younger, less experience. When I meet with my colleagues, I realize the only, I'm the only man there. It's true women are doing most of the teaching at the university and then all the research faculty are men. I wouldn't say there's an outward message that I should be doing more, but sometimes I wonder if there is. So he gets the feeling that he doesn't really fit in this path that is like degrading, devaluing. And he feels this upward pull. There's something that he can't quite place, but it's pulling him up. Um, so if, if you can move on, bringing this all together with like theories of the gender system, we see that women on, this, on the teaching faculty were being marginalized. They worked hard at paid, and I didn't mention this, but most of them had children at home. So they, after, after working like a full day, teaching university science classes, they would go home and, get their kids to dinner, get their kids to activities, um, do a bunch of work and then get back online at eight or 9 p.m. and answer student emails and plan and stuff. So they were working a lot. Um, 
but they lacked recognition and respect for the work that they were doing, um, despite being excellent teachers and getting good um, evaluations. The, it was a struggle to get fair pay. They had no clear path to, path to advancement. And um, other scholars have theorized these as glass obstacles. There were just a lot of things in their path that kept them from feeling satisfied and growth in their career. But the men had a different experience. So in the same job, they viewed it as a low effort job, that they were recognized and respected in their work, their decent pay was assumed, and they had this, uh, this glass escalator effect where they were pulled up, even though they weren't really putting in the effort. I can explain this, unfortunately, this isn't a good thing, but by the way that um, jobs have gendered associations. So this is kind of that stereotype piece. Teaching is seen as kind of feminized work. And we see that in the way that the, the, the women were kind of clustered in that. And so when women are doing teaching in a science department, they're recognizable first as teachers, which is devalued. Men doing the same work are recognizable as scientists. And so they're pulled up. Um, and I just had this one more quote from a 50 year old woman with 20 years of experience. She said, the culture in this department is, the culture in this department is toxic. I'm looking to get out. And so the contribution that I'm making to this kind of conversation that is going on within gender and the sciences, if you can move on, Soleil, is that it seems to be operating like a game of shoots and ladders. So this is a ch children's game. You may have played it when you were a kid, or maybe you have kids yourself. It, it, in its simplest form, it's fair. You spin a little dial, you move a certain um, number of squares forward, and if you land on a ladder, you get to go up. If you land on a shoot, well, you go back down. But in gendered shoots and ladders, women tend to be sliding down the shoots and men tend to be boosted by the ladders. That's not to say ne women never get a boost or men never are set back, but overall the pattern is that women slide back and men get these individual pull up. And in the end, you wind up with, even within a teaching faculty that's supposed to be like better for women, that it's stratified. So the research faculty is still at the top, but the teaching faculty is even women tend to be um, marginalized or under or disprivileged while men are privileged. Um, and so I'm going to stop there. I'd love to take some questions um, or hear some of your comments. And then I have a final discussion question. But let's leave this before we put up the last discussion question. And I guess you can raise your hands. Cindy. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for the for the presentation. Um, I am concerned about this uh, big picture of the most of the situation in the academia. It is very common. Uh, and then I I was wonder after this study and all these implications and um, what could be the best way to solve it because most of the women are just getting tired all the time to continue on this and if all women get tired at the end still it continues like a male dominated environment so after that so then i, I would like what is what could be the best strategies for young women that is just getting into these environments and that of course they are toxic and they don't gonna change from one day to another, but uh, which could be a good strategy to make uh, some efforts or things to um, to improve a bit mm -hmm. the, the situation? It's a big question. Um, I could talk for 10 minutes about it. I want to actually like maybe open it up to the group too. I don't know if anybody else like wants to jump in, um, and comment on Cindy's question as Mita. Oh, 
like I am amazed to see that like it's not just the engineering uh, work field where I come from that females are given the soft jobs and the males are given the tough jobs and then it's just because they have been doing the tough job the males get promoted but recently many of these engineering companies like my own company at the ex company that i used to work in we never had a director or a management a higher management people with females so many of the decisions that were related or that could show the experience of the female never existed so they kind of made another so among the seven directors that we had they appointed a new female director instead of from uh, like they kind of not appointed but then they hired the female director instead of having somebody from the senior management because there was no female available in the senior management to go into the director's role so i think that could be a possibility that the higher managements can be or the people at the top of any organization instead of having it an all male or uh this thing having a having female as well as in the top uh top mm -hmm. of the organization the decision making can help the ladies with the different track or they can develop different tracks for them to grow up that's the only way i can see that it can help at the at this current situation yeah as it goes forward things can change but currently this can be the only way that you can promote people at higher position and help the ladies come up more right yeah i think that's key and i want to add to it and and respond to you cindy that yes when when there are not role models in in the position the it's it's very hard for an individual who's underrepresented to imagine themselves going into that. So um, having more women in the research faculty is super important because then people don't believe the um, the story that they're told that they can't do it because they see women doing it, right? So it's really, really key. Um, and Cindy, I'll just add from a study that I'm doing of, I'm I'm now, interviewing non-tenure track faculty at like many many more universities to ask them about their experiences so a much wider sample of faculty and a couple of people have told me that having kind of been pushed into the teaching track and toiled in it for many years they really wish that they had um that they had done it that they had gone for it because they should have had more confidence in themselves. That's what they said. I wasn't confident and I didn't try, but I really wish I had. And so if you're thinking about like, how do I, how do I manage this? Like, don't forget that a lot of the messages that you get are not the truth. It's like the gender system working to lower your self-esteem, to keep you out. And so like the, the, the mentorship and like the connections are key to help you see where you can be um but it's it's hard like it's actively working to kind of marginalize you and that's what we see from or that's what i was kind of trying to convey from my study um other questions thank you you're welcome yeah Soleil. um i think it was i was thinking about uh, when when women has to push and push and push and just so uh, kind of show the, the normal that is is not i mean is is not that we are overachieving or is the way that we try to show the men that we are doing all that it that it takes just to be at the same level whilst for them it's like yeah it's it's the minimum i mean come on if if i would if i want to do more i, I could but uh, it's fine so it's like because there is this thing of uh we not trying to we don't believe in ourselves so what what you have to said but when it is the hinder of the overachieving maybe being against us you know what i mean it's uh, because it's it's like um, 
it's like it's a fake overachieving and it's, it's, it's not that we are trying to over it's not the stepping on them but we're trying to do the the maximum just to be shown as the minimum you know what i mean um mm -hmm. so it's like how can we because i'm thinking if we are many women in some of the sciences uh, maybe maybe not in not in all stems but it's still we're getting more and more women how can we make this something that is solid for the women that are coming under because there's no one woman in the in, in the uh, uh, career maybe there are five maybe there are three but they can uh, can pave in the way for the ones that are under so they don't need to repeat the same patterns maybe they don't need to overachieve because there is going to be a woman that can already says like you know maybe you deserve this maybe this grant it could be for you maybe this position you could apply it's still i mean it's difficult to 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 make the effort for other women but it's still is it possible because otherwise uh, how else we can do it <laughs> Um, I, I missed the end of your question. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Oh, you can. Okay. Um, I, I want to try to answer it, but I missed the end, but I have some ideas. Um, nice to see you. Thank you for joining Stefania. Um, I, um, okay, so something that is like that, that I'm thinking of when you mentioned that is this, um, that I'm kind of doing this, a similar research project in, in Sweden. So I'm studying a very similar department, um, in terms of the science discipline in terms of the composition of the faculty it's um, predominantly male um, they have different titles um, and different ways of apportioning the teaching but it's still women are underrepresented in sweden in the same way that they were in this study that i did in the united states and the reason i'm bringing this up is because um, I guess uh, quite a few of you are living. Elsa, do you live in Sweden? Yes. Okay. So Sweden has really fantastic support for women's. Okay, it, like much better support than the United States for for workplace participation for women. And what I'm seeing from doing a like a comparative study is that. Um, while the institutional pieces um, that are were really apparent in um, my US study are sort of alleviated. They're not as much of a problem in Sweden. Like for example, um, women don't say they went into the career because they couldn't get daycare for their kids or there wasn't maternity leave. And that's what people say in the United States. I did this because I knew we didn't have good daycare and I would need to take care of my children. Um, People don't say that in Sweden because there is good daycare in Sweden. But it appears that a lot of the gendering in Sweden is actually occurring at the individual level and the interactional level. So stereotypes and bias get reproduced more obviously. Um, and what that tells me, Soleil, uh, relative to your question is that because the sciences are so reliant on like the masculine culture of achievement and production, it's always going to bring up levels of the gender system. So in Sweden, a lot of the talk is about, we just need enough money, we have to get the money. It's all about procuring money to do our research. And everything's centered around that. And then they say things like, well, women don't get the money because women can't, don't take risks, which we know is, that doesn't make any sense. Women take tons of risks. Like having a baby is so risky, right? Like 
<laughs> I'm going to take many risks, but it can also, but it can be packaged into sexist thinking. And so it's important to um, think about both gender as a social system and then how it can be like interrupted um, through education, through conversation, through um, not kind of being like, oh, okay, so let's fix the women so they can fit into the system, but thinking about how can we change the system so that it's more welcoming for everybody. Um, so that those are kind of, I guess, some of the recommendations that I would have. Um, and that I think it can also connects to Cindy's question, which is that some of this work is thinking about disrupting the institution. So the study that I presented that I did, it's I think it's a, it's a good example of how damaging it can be when you set up a new class of academic of academics. When you're just like, oh, let's give them a different title and classify them lower. Like that's not a good idea. It devalues teaching. So it makes the teaching less valued in the university. It frees the researchers to kind of just not have to have any interaction with the students. And it puts it all on a certain class of people. They should have people who teach at the same level as the research faculty. Just because they can save a bunch of money by paying women less to do the teaching work doesn't mean that that's correct. It's wrong. They should, they should value teaching, right? So setting up different classes of people is not a good idea. That, and that would be a way to, to solve that problem. Um, but I do have one final slide, uh, which is like a kind of summative discussion because I'm really curious um, about like your own kind of personal experiences, your local contexts. What other solutions would you propose to interrupt patterns that, that like these, which I call gendered shoots and ladders? Um, I can say something. I don't really know exactly the solution, but I, I, from my experience in my job as a developer, it's a lot of ideas of how a person working with code is supposed to look like, and it's usually not a woman, and we are very few women. So uh, that also influences like how people look at you and um what you're assumed to do so like these yeah stereotypes and and ideas it kind of influence i guess if you think that this woman is supposed to or like if she's good at coding or if she's can be promoted to some higher level so i don't really know how to solve it but i see like a lot of prejudices amongst my colleagues so it would be nice maybe to have some kind of education or just, yeah, it, I think it would be nice uh, for me like that we had like a lecture or something that someone would talk about these questions in my office because I think that they just do it totally without thinking and they don't even see it as a problem. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I point it out, but I mean, it's not really my job. So yeah, maybe that could help. Yeah, it's something that I've noticed. I mean, like being kind of a a newcomer to the Swedish context is that um, most people kind of actually think of themselves as very gender equal or feminist, but that doesn't mean that they still don't behave in stereotypical ways. They don't reproduce stereotypes. And so um, it shouldn't be on those who notice it to point it out. Like you said, it's not really your job, but like the education piece around how everybody carries around implicit biases, that they're not just like, oh, I'm done with that, can be really powerful because it helps people to understand that it's not that they're a bad person, it's coming from, well, I would argue from like the social context. We get it so much that it's really hard. And, and it's it's men and women, right? It's just men that have the power. So when they have these stereotypes and enact them, it, it has a differential effect than women kind of having stereotypes about gender.
Yeah, sorry. I'm thinking, um, so I have a conversation with a, a group of, of women that were starting their careers, uh, STEM careers, I think it's engineering in Malmo University, and they were trying to bring up again a group of women in STEM in, the, in Malmo University. And they were telling me that uh, they, they see the discomfort of being the, the few ones in class uh, because the males in the classroom were having certain comments or behaviors against uh, or towards them that the, weren't going to help at any point in the future. So I was thinking like, as Elsa says, like, it's important that since even the, since the beginning of the bachelor careers, uh, maybe this also penetrates into this future male in STEM trying to be more supportive and aware of this issue and maybe make it, uh, try to make it more easy for them uh, as well at the end. And in this sense, I think, uh, uh, what we're doing in this project, it's it, it could be a mini solution, right? Because we are trying to create uh, maybe some. Uh, we have we have a, a, a self assessment. We have a toolkit, so maybe the teachers and the students can use it uh, on the class, right? And see how is the situation of the women in my classroom, and how I, as a teacher maybe can maybe portray a little bit more the two or three women that are here because maybe I'm not realizing that they are struggling to be at the end of this career because they don't feel comfortable in the class. Maybe they won't complain, but still it's, 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 uh, it's not obvious for us, maybe as faculty or something. Yeah, so I think in this side, uh, we need to keep, making efforts to try to support these women that are going at the end in this uh, uh going to continue in the career and, and following the researcher pathway some of them are going to work but in the researcher pathway it's in the it's in the bachelor or in the master where they have to be aware of this so that they can continue and maybe help the others i think so mm -hmm. Does anyone want to add something? I, I kind of have a um, idea that I want to um, add on to that. Um, okay, I'll go. Um, nice to see you, Elsa. Thanks for um, for joining. I'll just yeah, I'll quickly I'll quickly share this, and then maybe we should wrap up because it seems like we're losing people. Um, so the the. This research that I did um, with these teaching faculty who were largely women, the the students who they taught, who were bachelor students, undergraduates, um, were they didn't know that their um, that their instructors were not were non tenure track faculty were classified as lower right. than the tenure track faculty. To them, they were the teachers who had authority. And what that meant was that from the perspective of the Hello? Now I lost the internet. Yeah, but Hello? now I can listen. Yeah, hi. Hello. I lost, I think I lost my internet really briefly. Did you hear okay. any of what I said? No. No, 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 Catherine. So you can. Can you see me moving? Yes. Okay. Um, but did you hear any of my, my comment? No. Okay, so vis-a-vis um, -vis what what you mentioned, Soleil, from from the, the the for the for the bachelor students who were, who the people who I was studying were teaching, they didn't know that they were a different category of faculty. To them, they were it was their 
teacher, they had authority. And so from a gender perspective, there were women role models. <clears throat> but what it also meant was that when those students progressed, then they kind of would realize at some point that the women role models weren't there. And so the the reason I think it's important to like do the education and have the conversation all along is because at some point people's perspectives will shift and then they don't know how to handle it, right? So at the bachelor's level, it's important to have the conversation whether the discrimination is occurring there or not, because this like the fact that it's systemic within the sciences means that we will encounter it eventually. Um, in my own personal experience, I had like actually a, a unique experience. I went to a, a women's college. So my undergraduate years were spent with only women. And it was extremely empowering. Like I loved being like in in a in a place as a, a young a young scientist where it was um there were no men to kind of act like they knew everything and make me feel like maybe I shouldn't be there. But as soon as I left my undergraduate institution and went to graduate school in chemistry, I was did not know how to handle the sexism. I was like, wow. And I, I actually also just published a paper in July about reflecting on that experience, how I was like blindsided by the level of sexism that was happening in in research labs. And so while it was good to go to a women's college and I got a great education, I wasn't prepared for the real world. And so that preparation piece is really important to always be kind of talking about. There is a social side of doing the sciences and we need to address that too. I, I think the, the time is going also fast that we could stay here longer, but uh, I feel the same, as you have said, this is almost the same experience for me, uh, going in a, in a bachelor that it was uh, all women, and then when I jumped into the working area, then it crushed uh, all my expectations or and uh, the idea of what I had when I was going to work. No one prepared me for the machism that it was going to be and the hierarchy that it was so strong to deal. And then uh, it gives you the feeling that you have no, no all that you have done and your worth and uh, it's not worth. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I feel the same. Uh, regardless, if, if there's only women in the classroom, this, this should be talk because it's, it's out there somewhere, but it's, it's out there. Mm. Did you say something? Yeah. I think we, yeah. I'm really sorry, but I think my internet is getting worse. I'm having yeah. trouble hearing you. <laughs> Um, but this has been a real, um, a real privilege, um, and, and really informative. It's been lovely to meet y'all, um, if only on this webinar. So I'm going to say bye, um, because I'm not really able to participate well. Um, but I look forward to, to hearing more about your project and please keep me in the loop. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Bye, and Wolfgang, Cindy, Asmita, thank you for this participation. Hope to see you next month on the next thank seminar. You so thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.